Up next would be Ken Blake. He's the VP of Analytics at AMP. Ken, you are up next, my friend. Sounds good. And am I sharing my screen from my end? Is that how we're doing this? Uh, if you can, if you want. Yeah, let me just... Uh, All right. One second, please. All right, that's working? Yep, you're all okay, set. Okay, great. So that's actually a pretty good, that's a great presentation, Jess, appreciate it. That was a pretty good segue into what we're gonna talk about because we think about the complexity in what we do. Uh, building trust with those who are less technical than us is really important. And that's true whether you are a analyst who's doing mostly hands-on work or whether you're someone who's trying to sell analytic solutions because by definition, and when I say clients, by the way, it could be clients if you're with an agency, it could be internal business partners, it's whoever your, your final stakeholders are for whatever analysis you're building or whatever analysis you're trying to sell. By definition, they are going to be non-technical people for the most part, or at least less technical than you. So regardless of where you are in the organization um, and what your, what your role is in analytics, it's something that, that we should all keep top of mind as we, as we do our work day to day. So we'll talk about the importance of trust, and that may seem like an obvious topic, but hopefully we'll touch on some things that maybe are less obvious. I'll give my perspective on what a trusted relationship looks like, and I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well. Uh, we'll talk about why trust issues are so prevalent in our industry um, as, as analysts and why there's some unique challenges that we need to overcome. I'll share my views on where I think analytics teams stumble the most in building trust with clients. And then we'll talk, we'll close with a, with a talk about, about a, a path for gaining trust with clients. All right, so first, the obvious reasons why trust is important. You need to win new business and you need to maintain client relationships. It's, it's as simple as that. No matter how talented your analytics team is, if you don't have that trust with the client, you're not gonna get very far in either of these two areas. But a couple of less obvious areas is, one of them is, our work really has no value if it's not actioned against. And without trust in us as analysts and in and the analysis that we did, clients are gonna be much more hesitant to act upon it, which essentially renders all of our efforts meaningless. So one of the key indicators I look for when I'm evaluating trust, trust with my clients is how, how often and how extensively are they using the work that we provide versus we do an analysis and it kind of sits on somebody's somebody's desktop for a while, but, but it never gets action against. So that's one key piece. The other key piece, and this is more of, a, of, of an agency need, is it, it's important to avoid what I call legless work. So legless work means, uh, if, if, it, if analysis has legs, it means it, it makes its way around the client's office. So beyond just the stakeholders that you're, that you're presenting to and that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, and analysis with legs will make its way to other parts of the organization and hopefully senior parts of the organization, which is important for your exposure and it's important to, to, to grow the work that you're doing with that particular client. And, and second is, you know, it leads to that additional work um, that provides business value both to you as an analyst and your company, but also to the client. So all four of these, um, well, you know, some of them are more focused on the kind of that selfish view of why I need to build trust with my client it's also important to the clients for them to have trust in you. So what does a trusting relationship look like? The first piece is everyone understands their strengths and weaknesses, and most importantly, they, they openly acknowledge them. So we talked before about how um, we have, you're going to be specialists in your role, and you're probably dealing with a bunch of generalists. One sign of trust is where clients are letting you do what you're best at and they're focused on doing what they're best at. Communication is efficient and, and purposeful. This is, this is sort of related to the first one in that if you find that your conversations with clients are, feel a little micromanaging, um, that's typically a sign that there's not great trust between the two organizations. Ideally what the clients are doing is, from a communication standpoint is, they're very purposeful in what they're asking for and they trust that you'll take it along with it. So that's another sign I look for when I, when I look at a client relationship. And the, the most important piece is that shared, shared vision and that all stakeholders describe the same shared vision. So something I also look at when I'm, when I'm evaluating trust is I'll ask the clients, what is their articulation of what we're trying to accomplish together as a team? 
and I'll get that answer. And then I'll ask my analytics leads, what is their articulation of that shared vision? If there's a significant difference in the way they answer those questions, there's, there's either a trust problem now or you will get to one in the future. So that shared vision is, is, is absolutely critical. So let me pause here and open up to the group. What, in your organizations or in your work, what, what indicators do you see of either a relationship that is trusting or one that is maybe less so? Yeah, Ken, I'll, I'll, I'll take this right off the bat here. Um, so one, I wanted to mention something about that first one. Everyone understands their strengths and weaknesses. This comes along with just being honest. So like, hey, this is our specialty. We work you know, with predictive models. We don't, you know, we don't work with segmentation or whatever it happens to be. Being honest that we're not the experts. We have a, we have a way of thinking about this, but you know, we're open to learning from other people because we know that we're not the be all end all and you know, the buck doesn't stop with us in terms of what the methodology is. Really important for analytics people to be honest about, here's where my knowledge is and I can always augment that knowledge. People don't like to know that, oh, we're the experts and you can't go to anyone else because it doesn't seem cooperative. When you say that you're willing to, you know, you're willing to learn, it means that your clients are willing to, you, to them, it means that you're willing to listen to them more. So I really wanted to add that in there. I thought that was important. Kind of yeah, great point. Anyone else? Hey there, it's Kathy. Um, the middle one is really interesting to me, and I wonder if this is the place where you touch back to the um, uh, the idea that you're an insight provider, not just a, re a reporter or a, a measurement person, figuring out how to come to the same page at the right time in the process there seems like it allows you to get to the, the same shared vision. I worked in three or four different teams across in different places in a, in a B2B technology company. And um, I found different levels of success in getting that, that agreement on being an insight partner um, and being invited into the conversation in order to be, to be able to show each of these three. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one, the, the two ends of the spectrum there are times are, what I love to hear from a client is, hey, we have this idea. Can you guys come as analytics people come back with thoughts on it? And it could be sizing the opportunity. It could be yeah. validating that it truly is an opportunity. That's a great conversation to have with a client because that shows that they want your input and they understand that the data and the insight is, is ultimately what's going to drive success. What you don't want to hear is, and I've had clients like this too, who, say, who give a laundry list of, can you pull all these metrics from me? Yeah. With, with, you know, without the context as to what are they trying to do with it, because that, that's where we just can't add the same level of value as if we were truly part of the solution rather than just a hands-on keyboard at the end. Yeah. Thanks for that, Kathy. Any, anybody else before we move forward? Okay. I have, I have had an experience where people usually confuse between analyst and analytics professional. And uh, they usually consider people with business intelligence background as people who can provide insights, which I think analytics professionals can do much more better. Uh, that's what I have uh, seen so far. And uh, I would like to, you know, add to what Kathy just said that, yeah, people should be, uh, analytics professionals should be taken as insight providers and not just people who dig up past data and, you know, tell what has happened. Because until unless you can predict that what will happen, uh, it's not of much use. Yeah, and it's and in a lot of cases, a big part of our role is to educate the organization or educate our clients as to what is our role, what are what are our capabilities, what is the value that we can provide. Because to to your point, sometimes they may see you as those are the people that build dashboards for me, and they don't know what else is they don't know what goes into that. They don't know what else is what else is possible. So that's. That's a big part of our responsibility to, to continually educate as to what we can do. And, and to Joe's point earlier, what we can't do, because there's some things that we're not experts in and we don't want, we don't want to get caught in that, in that area. So why is trust uniquely difficult um, in, the, in the world that we live in? Um, you know, all, all competency teams struggle with gaining trust from their clients or business partners, but when it's data and analytics, I think we need to be particularly aware of how important it is to build trust and, and, and times how difficult it can be. 
So one of the challenges that run into a lot is if you think about the number of stakeholders that you may be dealing with, with any kind of analysis that, that you're doing, it could be, it could be just one, it could be, it could be dozens. And all of them are going to have different objectives that they're trying to achieve. Ideally, they're all looking for some kind of a solution to a business problem, right? And, and when it's kept as general as that, those, that's usually a sign of an analytics relationship that's going really well, where the client comes to you with a business problem and says, hey, go figure this out for me, guys, because we, we can't get our head around this. But then you also have people who essentially want the analysis to validate something that they've already concluded, right? And it's typically there's some confirmation bias there. So they are looking for something that is going to validate what they already think. And they may have a harder time embracing conclusions that, that conflict with that. And then some are just looking for ammunition to convince others. So they've decided what the right decision is, and now they need to go convince their boss or other, other of their peers that their idea is right. So you've got those three competing objectives, which often would, if you just followed them, would yield to a different type of analysis. But sometimes you actually have these three competing objectives within the same person that you're dealing with, which is a whole different story and even more, more complex and more challenging. So our role is to, is to consult with our clients to help them reconcile these three areas. And there are probably others that we can come up with, but those are three of the ones that, that come up a lot to help them reconcile what are they truly trying to solve for and sometimes hold their hand through the reality that the analysis is not showing what they thought it would. It may, it may directly refute what their, what their initial hypothesis was, or it may refute a strategy and investments that they, that they, that they already made. So creating that trust and relationship is, is very important for that handholding process. So another challenge is, is that by definition, we are specialists and we're often dealing with generalists. And so we're coming and we're coming at the situation with very different skill sets and very different mindsets. So, so in a lot of ways, your audience can be a complete opposite of you. And, and that in itself presents a challenge because the way you think about things, they're going to be very different. Um, and you know, while the, the idea of opposites attract sounds nice, uh, in, in my experience, that's not how it works in business. So it can be very difficult to build that relationship with somebody that just comes from a completely different, different mindset. So I don't know that this quote here is exactly the perfect quote for this situation, but I also believe that when you're presenting to a large group of people, one of the most important things is for everyone to take away something memorable from the conversation. So I hope you get a lot of value out of this presentation. But if not, at least when you think back on this, you'll remember that this is the presentation where for some reason there's an Ashton Kutcher quote within an analytics presentation. So hopefully you at least take that away. That's unique, Ken. That's real hey, unique. Hey, I mean, last time I went with all the Seinfeld references. Now right. I'm making, I'm making it even more random now. <laughs> All right, so would love some dialogue on this one. Um, got a couple different areas where I see analytics teams stumble the most when they're trying to build trust. And one of them is this whole idea of the data speaks for itself. And you'll hear analysts say this all the time. And it's, it's, it comes out of a level of, of frustration in a lot of cases where um, we think we've made a very clear empirical case for why the analysis is drawing a certain conclusion. Um, but we have to remember that, that it's, it's not about the data speaking for itself. We, our job is to make the data speak to the particular audience, right? And data will speak to different, different, in different ways to different audiences. So we need to be that translation layer between the very technical world that we live in um, and the marketing or media or creative or sales or whatever, whatever product, whatever organization we're supporting, they're going to speak a very different language and we need to make that translation to them so that the data speaks to them. It's not, we don't come in with the attitude of, well, it's obvious because look at these numbers. So that's one big area that I see a lot. A second one is around this idea of we're, we're focused on trying to be right rather than focused on getting it right. I'll explain what that means. And another offshoot of this is, is the, you know, the comment that you'll hear from a lot of analysts that the client just doesn't, just doesn't get it. So you see the cartoon here where um, kind of a, an insulting, uh, insulting mindset that can pop into our head. This one is critical and, and is a common trap that I think analysts fall into. So we can get so focused on, on proving with overwhelming evidence that our analysis is right and that it points in a certain direction. 
But we forget that, that getting it right is really the goal. And getting it right is not about proving our point from our perspective. It's about proving our point from the perspective of the client. So similar to the prior slide, know who your audience is, know what makes them tick, know how they consume data and think about things, and translate it and communicate in a way that's going to be most relevant to them. That, that's a critical piece to building trust. And then this one you'll see a lot too, and this kind of goes to the other side where we as analysts can at times be um, hesitant to share bad news. And depending on what kind of an organization you work in, you may get pressure inside your organization to not share bad news. You know, especially if you're with an agency where you may be analyzing work that your company recommended. So clearly there's a sensitive situation here and something that needs to be um, it needs to be handled as a team internally. But the, my main piece of, piece of advice here is, you know, start with a truly objective view of what's happening from a factual standpoint as to what your analysis is saying. You know, kind of taking that referee or um, umpire mindset where you see your job as calling it a ball or a strike or the runner was out at first base or, the, or did the football player catch the ball before it hit the ground. You can think of any number of, of analogies. Start with that, with that referee mindset, but then switch it to, sort of a combination of a referee and coach. So here's the objective outcome. That's the referee's job. But here are some diagnostic insights that we can use to make this more effective next time. So, so in other words, when results of analysis are going to be disappointing to a client or to your internal partners, we're not providing the best value when we just rain on everybody's parade and just, and just leave it at that. Where we can provide value is where our focus is both on providing clarity as to what actually happened but also providing that more subjective view of here's what could have happened with a modified approach. So let me pause there and open it up again. What am I missing? What, what other areas do you see analytics teams stumble when they're trying to build trust with the client? Yeah, Clint, Ken, I'll, I'll, I'll pick this up again too. Um, so one of the things that links all of these together is when analytics is, um, is really in that, uh, the sort of the, the order taking instead of the strategic partner. So, you know, all of these, all of these little these stumbling blocks come up because analytics in part hasn't understood really the root cause of what their client is trying to get at. So one of the important skill sets that a, a good analytics organization or an analytics team has is being able to listen to what their partner's challenges are, but then understanding kind of why those challenges occur and the data should go after why those challenges are occurring rather than just what they want. So that, you know, you're, you're really solving what their process problems are, what, what lies beneath what they think is their issue. And if you can get at that second layer that they're not telling you because they don't know it, then you'll, a lot of these things will be, you know, a lot, a lot of these stumbling blocks will be addressed in that. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Yeah, and, and some of the most trusting relationships come from successfully sharing bad news with a client or sharing something with them that they didn't think was going to be going to be true. Because if you can do that successfully, now they realize they have a partner that they can rely on to make them look better. Because no matter what the client says, no matter any, what any of us say, all of us are trying to grow in some ways. We might be trying to get promoted, people are trying to get more um, uh, more notice internally, more credit internally. So they look at their partners as people who can help them get ahead in their career or accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish. So the, the more that we can get them to think of us as partners on that path, rather than potentially threats to that path, the better off we'll be. Anything else here? Yeah, I'd like to add something. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've seen uh, analytic teams like define predictive model modeling problems without even looking at the data itself, like, like without knowing what kind of a data you have or what, what other data can you collect? So defining problems before that somewhere you can stumble upon with some problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, because I think a lot of times, in analytics, we, we think the rest of the organization does things like that, where marketing comes up with ideas that aren't fully vetted, and they do, right? But we can, we can fall prey to that same problem by deciding what the solution is before we've even figured out the viability of it. Or to your point, Rebecca, do we even have the right data? 
Uh, absolutely. So it's, it, that exploratory piece is is critical for any kind of analysis, especially especially for for a model where I think in a lot of cases we kind of get in our head as to what kind of model or what kind of segmentation should be built before we've really done the proper vetting up front in terms of what's what's possible and what ultimately are we going to be able to do effectively. Yeah, and I think uh, sometimes you know problems can be solved by a simple machine learning model instead of diving into deep learning or something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ken, I just have a question and I just wanted yeah. to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I have seen that uh, uh, centralized analytics teams perform a little uh, less efficiently as compared to decentralized. And by decentralized, I mean there is one or two analytics professionals in each team. So they have the specific domain knowledge and they have the necessary skills as well. Because I know I was once uh, assigned a uh, analytics uh, challenge for you know for for an investment firm, and I had very little knowledge about the financial instruments which work. So first I had to study a lot about the financial instruments, and then I had, I was able to you know provide uh, analytics based solutions. So what do you think is a better idea in terms of team structuring? Should it be centralized or should it be decentralized? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I'm not sure that the answer is always one way or the other. I think it depends, somewhat depends on the level of complexity or differentiation between different parts of an organization. You know, I think the the, the benefits of a centralized organization is more likely to have shared learnings, easier to move people around to uh, cover the ebb and flow of work. But to your point, if, if the downside of that is we have a bunch of analysts that may be very technically skilled, but they're not strategically knowledgeable about what they're doing, then that goes back to what we were talking about before, is that if our job is to provide insight and solutions and not just you know, coding and dashboards, we need to have a deep understanding of that part of the business. So I'm not gonna answer the question centralized or decentralized um, as, as a definitive answer. I think it really depends. But ultimately, the, the, the outcome that I'd be looking for and the outcome I do look for when I'm, when I'm building teams and, and trying to grow teams is do we have enough, for those that are doing the day-to-day -day work, do they have enough knowledge and are they embedded closely enough with that part of the business to be anything more than a technical resource? because you'll never build trust if you're just a technical resource, because ultimately what your partners will see us as is the people that can go run some code for us or go pull some metrics. And like we were talking about earlier, we don't wanna be in a situation where the clients are deciding what the analysis should be. The clients should decide what is the business problem we're trying to solve. They can certainly consult on the analysis, but our expertise is gonna best, um, best be shown if we not only have the technical skills, but also the, the deep knowledge of the business. So I, you know, I, I think it can go either way, but if you don't have the deep knowledge of the business, um, you're gonna have a problem. So if decentralized gets, gets you there for that, type of, for that particular organization, then that's the way I would go for that, that particular organization. Uh, on the top of that, I, oh, yeah. On the top of that, I have another follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, usually I've heard that a subject matter uh, expert helps in the entire process to basically thread the gap between the client and the data analyst. Uh, so is that subject matter experts comes from like the client's team or from the consultation uh, like firm? So a subject matter expert, that's, that's sort of kind of a middle person between the business and the analyst. So is it, would it be sort of a strategist role? Is that the way you're thinking of it? Yeah, I think it can come from either side. Um, and I've certainly seen it work and, and not work in both cases that, and I'm just thinking of my clients right now and where it works and where it doesn't work. You know, in, in some cases, we, we are that middle person. It, sometimes it's an analytics person who just has more of a consultative background or consultative mindset. And he or she can be that, that conduit or that, that translation layer. Sometimes it's somebody on the strategy team if you're with a you know, digital agency or, or a consulting agency. But it also works well when you've got somebody on the client side who can fill that role because they can help unblock a lot of the challenges that are more difficult to do from the outside um, and help communicate internally as to what those needs are. You know, so going back to analysts, not necessarily, or 
clients not necessarily understanding what analytics can do for them, having that internal person can be really valuable, um, especially if you're dealing with a really complex organization. And, and the skill set you want that person to have is you don't need them to be a deeply knowledgeable analytics person, but ideally they're deeply knowledgeable about the business and have a good working knowledge of analytics because then they can bring that piece together. So it can, it can work both ways, but that, that, that person, whether it's one person or a group of people, is really critical to, to the work that we do. All right, so we've talked a lot about why this is hard to do and all the ways that we screw it up. So let's be, let's be positive and, and, and talk about what ways can we solve for this. This whole slide is about orienting the way that we think and the way that we behave um, in, in a way that's, that's most likely to build trust. And this applies to whether we're talking about a specific analysis or something broader where we're pitching new business to a client. So part of it is just starting with the right mindset. Um, and, and I think of this in, in some ways as, as confidence in what we do. And to keep in mind that no matter how much a client may nitpick an analysis or um, you know, ask questions or challenge things that, that we think are obviously uh, accurate or obviously true, the clients need your expertise. They, they hired you. Right? They've either hired you or they're at least having a conversation with you about potentially hiring you. So they need your expertise. They know they need your expertise and they want to have a trusting relationship. So even when a client relationship is difficult and it may not feel trusting, they want to get to the same place that, that, that you want to get to. It's, it's critical to them for all the reasons that we talked about earlier and that they want the analysis that they get to be something that they're confident in that they can go act upon and that they can share it across the organization. So. Think of this as a partnership to get to a trusting relationship, not something that is solely on the part of the analyst. So think and speak like, like a generalist. Um, when I look back at, at analysts that I've had on my teams over the years, if there's one behavior that distinguishes one that's really strong versus someone who may not be as strong, I, I, I think about how do they behave in terms of the kind of questions they ask or even what their mindset is when they're hearing a client articulate a business problem. So if you're an analyst and a client has articulated a business problem, if your mind immediately goes to what data do you need to pull? What queries do you need to run? I would, I would take, take a step back and think, is this really the time to start with that kind of a, with dealing with the, the tactics of the mechanics? Mindset should really start as what business problem are they trying to solve? Why are they trying to solve it? What's the value of solving it? Um, what are the different ways that we might be able to answer that question? And then get into the data. So that's, that's my you know, guidance for anybody, especially those of you who uh, maybe are newer to the workforce. Try to think like a generalist when you're having conversations with clients. You know, even if you're not an active participant in the, in the conversation, don't let your mind immediately go to what queries am I going to run? Because you're probably going to miss something in terms of, in terms of the, the business impact they're trying to drive. And if you're more on the uh, selling side, sell the outcome, don't sell the process. Clients for the most, we're typically not selling to organ uh, analytics organizations. We're selling to marketers and salespeople and, and, and product people and merchandising and finance organizations in some cases. So they care about the outcome. They don't necessarily care about the process. So focus on what, what matters to them, not what matters to you. I made the comment earlier about, you know, we, we can get into that mindset of, well, the client doesn't, doesn't get it. Um, spending a day with the creative department and creative department doesn't have to be that. Sp spend a day or orient yourself around a competency group that you're not comfortable with, that you don't know an, a, a lot about. And you'll quickly realize that we don't always get it either, right? We may always get the analytics piece, but we may not get the creative piece. We may not get the marketing piece. So, have some empathy for our clients who are not as technical. Yeah, they don't always get what we're talking about, but we don't always get what, what they're talking about. So we'll think of that as a two-way street um, so that you can work together to educate each other and, and have more productive relationship. And then finally, and I'd say if, if there's the most important one here is, is tell the client's story, not your own story. When you're presenting an analysis or building an analysis, um, ultimately, it needs to be in the client's voice and needs to speak to them in a way that's going to be relevant to them, not what's relevant to you. So one of the quotes I use, which Joe has probably heard many times, 
um, over the years because we've worked together a few different spots is analysis is not priced per pound. So if we need 50 slides to tell a story, fine. Use 50 slides to tell the story. I'd be surprised if you need that many, but think of it in terms of you, you, the job of, of the analyst is not to share everything that you did with the client. The job of the analyst is to share what we found and why it's important to them. So brevity and being concise is a great way to not only be more efficient in our work, um, but also build trust with the client because it shows them that you understand what they're trying to accomplish and you're speaking to them in their language. And that is it. So um, happy to take any more questions or hear any more thoughts. Um, here's my contact information. I'd love to chat with anybody who wants to talk more. Any other questions or closing thoughts? Joe, I know you'll have something. Always well, you've got other topics I, to get to, so you don't have to. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I like the summary. I think, I think it really, I think, especially that speaking like a generalist really kind of, you know, that's, that's where I was coming from too. You know, like it's, it's important for everyone in analytics really to think about what the business question is. And then that's what we're delivering the story on is the answer to the business question. And so if we, if we can get those two things, that's how we really start to build trust. Yeah, exactly. Let's say thank everyone for coming. Please don't forget to fill out the, um, the survey. And for those of you who did come and you did stay this whole time, uh, feel free to connect with me either through, um, through the email address listed on the screen or through mine directly. I will put this right now in. That's my email. Feel free to contact me. Um, I'm willing and able and would like to talk with you for about a half an hour just to kind of see what your positions are, what your challenges are, and, you know, how we can help, how we can um, sort of uh, collaborate, cooperate, see, uh, to see what we can do. So that's, that is part of a kind of an offer that I want to put out there just because you stayed for the whole length of time. So um, that'll keep you up to date as well on uh, what we do and what's coming up next with the forum. Are there any last minute questions here? All right, well then, Ken, thanks for the presentation. Good to see you, good to, uh, good to hear what you have to say. Always insightful, I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, Jessica, thank you for yours. And thank you everyone for attending and have a wonderful weekend. See ya.